two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Welcome in to this Feedback Friday edition of Mackie and Judd. Judd uh, celebrated a big milestone last night in the mm-hmm. shadows of TCF Bank. Well, I was going to say TCF Bank. Huntington Bank yeah, Stadium thank now. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Judd, you uh, for the first time since your appendectomy, you uh, you drank beer, I believe. Was the... yeah, I did. I did. Oh. Logic bomb before I dies. <laughs> Let, was that your first just... beer since the appendectomy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. I The last time I drank before the appendectomy was the day before it, which would have been uh, two weeks ago uh, Thursday. And so I took, you know, two weeks off, basically. And then I said, you know what? It's time to go back. It's time to go back. I will say this. The tailgate I went to uh, was sponsored by a beer that was not my beer. And so I hauled the cooler from home because I said, I ain't, I, I'm i drinking sur- Surly. I'm going to drink my Surly's because I was not going to break my my uh, my streak of non-drinking days with a non-Surly product. So my loyalty to the Logic Bomb, the Furious, Before I Die, it knows no boundaries. Amazing. I was hauling a cooler around. I uh, I also had my first drink of an adult beverage since before. I, it's been twelve days since I I finally tested negative yesterday. So I'm oh I'm did you okay? Free. Congratulations! Yeah. I did not know that. And I celebrated that and also a Gophers victory starting the season one and zero with a little bubbly, a little champagne last night. Oh, That's you right. did. Mm-hmm. How how you feeling this morning? Okay, uh, feel, feel pretty. I was. I was immediately tired. I was immediately tired and fell asleep for like three minutes of the third quarter. But then I rallied, and nice. I uh, and I got to watch the Gophers uh, hang a thirty-eight nothing win over Jerry Killen Company. Let's get into some of the, well, we'll get into a bunch of these questions from uh, the audience. Every Friday, we take your comments, questions, concerns, critiques, theories on things. Could be sports, could be life, whatever you want. And, uh, and we, we put them in a stew here on Feedback Friday on both Mackie and Judd and Purple Daily. You can always send us messages through the Score North app. Our guy Declan is away at the cabin for a long holiday weekend before strapping in for football season, which officially officially starts next week in the NFL. But uh, what, are your, what, what were your thoughts? Let's start with the Fleck kill stuff. So before the game last night, yeah, and obviously there's been all this drama, mostly fueled by Jerry Kill, who... Mm-hmm who publicly said on our show five years ago he would never step foot again inside TCF Bank Stadium at the time. And uh, he was upset about the way that that PJ was sort of portraying the situation. Right. They, they need to start from year zero and clean up the mess, that it wasn't really a mess. And then he tells Randy Shaver a week or two ago, I'm not sure if I'm going to shake his hand. So he's just been kind of publicly complaining about P.J. Fleck, and P.J. went right up to him before the game, about an yep. hour before the game, yep. just made a beeline right for Jerry Kill, who was in the middle of talking to some assistants, and he pulled him away. They talked for like three minutes, and P.J. did the old alpha thing, the arm around yes. Jerry, slapping him on the chest. Jerry yeah. looked a little uncomfortable with the interaction, but I think with that and then the post game, they did kind of the same thing post game. It looks like this thing is put to bed. I don't know. Credit to PJ for making the beeline before the game, though, and making it less weird after the game. So the PJ beeline was the least surprising thing of all time. Like, like that is, you you knew he was going to seek out, kill, and, and if nothing else, make it look good, right? For a guy like, that so, likes to have uncomfortable conversations for yes, breakfast, as he says. That was his thing. Here's where I'm disappointed in, in kill. And you know what? Jerry Kill is a drama king. Um, for a guy that talks a big game, you know, I'm never going back in that stadium. Okay. At the time it's a great sound bite, but you know, and, and then he, he, he subsequently has to coach a game there. So he's back. But for a guy who like, I don't know if I'll shake his hand, Randy, I don't know if I'm going to do this. I don't know if I'm going to do that. And then, you know, so, so the question becomes, can the drama King out duel, uh, PJ's, uh, Ability to try to at least create the perception he's taking control, right? Very disappointing kill. Like, if you're that worked up, just bristle and, like, walk away or something. Like, or or just don't say it. Like, that's fine, too. But that whole thing played out exactly like you thought it might, which is, to your point, Fleck is, I'm going to eat uncomfortable conversations for <laughs> breakfast. Hey, yeah, you know, Jerry, I know there's some, you know, I know there's been some things, but let me tell you right now. And Jerry just sort of like listening. 
I really would have liked if if Kill had just like walked away after talking all of that talk. It was a little. Uh, yeah, like it was. He, no, you, don't do he, it. He talked a huge game for years, basically, and he has trashed PJ Fleck for years. And I don't know what to make of this because, on one hand, I think there probably is some validity to the to the the feelings that he has toward Fleck. I'm a I'm I'm rowing the boat. I'm a Fleck guy. I do criticize some of his just you know, in-game coaching stuff and the run pass yeah. ratios and stuff and yep. but I but generally he has done an excellent job with this program. Is he a little bit of a used car salesman, sort of marketing hype man? Absolutely. Do I think you have to be that, especially if you're not at an Alabama, you're not at one of these marquee programs, USC. I mean, even those guys have to do it to some extent. I mean, Nick Saban has to play the game a little bit. But if you're the Gophers and you're just buried right smack dab in the middle of college football in terms of relevance, Mm -hmm. You need to sort of hype and elevate and come up with things that cut through the noise. So I I I like what PJ Fleck has done, but I also see how it could rub other people the wrong way. And the way that he came in and basically said, for me to to put this program on the map, I need to I can't come in and say that everything's fine. I need to say that we are my mission statement needs to be clear. We are gonna take this thing to a new level. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like the gophers were at a, a super high level with Jerry Kill, they were competent. They were going to bowl games. It was kind of like it was during the Glenn Mason era. So right. I, I get what PJ's doing. I get why Jerry Kill was kind of pissed about it. And I get why Jerry Kill thinks that PJ is maybe a little bit disingenuous. But based on all of the lead up, I thought I thought Jerry uh I thought he copped out a little bit. I'm with oh, you. Did. I think he, he kept big, over. Big, big smile. Hey PJ. I would say and get I, your I hand off a me. A little more tension there. Yeah. I would say get your hand off me. Philip John, right now. And that's how you get to him. Philip Phil, John. Phil, he would hate Phil, that. Phil, Phil, get your hand off me. Get your hand off me. Now, here's where I will. So, so yes, Fleck is. Fleck has his definite faults. There's no question about it. Now, to be very clear, all college football coaches do. Like, that job stinks. And if you are like. Like, oh, he's the greatest guy on earth. I, I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to last in college football long. They all have their huge, incredible deficiencies and faults. But where I will side with Fleck in what he said when he got here is right or wrong of, and, and I don't know, but there was accusations of what, a party? A, yes. And if nothing else, a sexual assault, Okay. If I'm brought in as a coach to replace the guy who had who oversaw that, and and it might all end up to be absolutely true, it might not be true. But there's no question. Mark Coyle said we got problems here, and and you had the threat of a player boycott at one point. My point being is that's a mess, and and if it's not a scandal, it borders on a scandal. Okay, so that's what Fleck was told. Now the other thing, and this is where Jerry killed to me his his being mad falls completely apart. And Phil, I think we debated this and we might have argued at one point, but I think by the end of it, we ended up on the same page, which is this. Tracy Clays was in no way qualified to be a division one big time college football coach. Like we talked about that. And so, so if Jerry Kill had, had made it through that season and then said, you know what? I'm done. And, and, and Fleck had come in and said, yeah, this program's a mess. I would get it. I would get Kill's disdain for that. But at the end of the day, when Clay's left with, with and by the way, proved he did not belong here. You know, goodbye, Minnesota, freeze your ass off, or whatever that was, yeah. which was a hysterical line. But that's a that's an amateur move. That's amateur hour. Um, and there's a reason why he hasn't had a whole lot of exactly. high-profile uh, The point you know, being is, since then. I guarantee you that the powers that be that hired Flex said, we got some problems here. So like I, I like Jerry Kill to me, and look to this day I feel sad. Like him stepping down was hard to watch. The man had 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 health issues that he could not control, and it was it was painful to have to watch a person who clearly enjoyed or loved what they did have to quit. Okay, but the second that you say I have to take care of me, and you walk out that door, and Tracy Clay's gets that that job, I don't care how much you like Clay's. You lost the program. Like Tracy Clays didn't have control. Dude, they were at, like football-wise, at the one, at the two, and they let the clock run out, basically. Yeah, there was Tracy so, Clays was, was definitely in over his head as a leader. And it's funny because I think yes. 
any sort of comments that Fleck made, it was more of a reflection on the end of the, it was the Tracy Clay's portion of the program. Yes. And some of the, I think there was 10 players that were initially accused of sexual assault. And it turned out that like half of them really didn't have anything to do with it. And it, and so I get some of the sentiment that, hey, there's, this is way unfair for a few players, but, but, but there was, it was, a, it was a thing for several months. And there were some players that were doing things that, were either illegal or that they definitely should not have been doing. And then the inmates try to run the asylum by boycotting the holiday bowl, right? The whole, and then, and then the coach just kind of sits back. And so the whole thing was a mess. However, however you want to slice and dice it. Mm -hmm. And PJ was essentially commenting on the state of the program under Tracy Clay's. And maybe he, I don't know, maybe he did. If you, if you, you know, if you got to the, to the truth of it, maybe he did think that Jerry killed did a bad job too. But my interpretation was less about, him hating Jerry Kill. He's always said good things about Jerry Kill. And Jerry took it very personally that one of his closest confidants, Tracy Clays, was sort of being thrown under the bus. Uh, so I'm glad that it's over. From an actual on-field perspective, it was so hard to <laughs> glean really anything because New yes. Mexico State was so bad. But uh, good to see Mo, uh, Mo Ibrahim back in the mix with, with 132 yards. The Gophers have some receivers. Michael Brown-Stevens, Chris Ottman bell mm -hmm. Um and again, it's so hard to tell, but Tanner Morgan's in like his sixth year of college football, fifth year as a starter, so he should look really good at this point. And he's got his offensive coordinator back, and they collaborated very well in 2019. So I thought, uh, I actually kind of agreed with Jerry DiNardo at halftime. He he spent, you know, the Gophers were just rolling New Mexico State, right. and but he took three or four minutes at halftime to bitch about the run-pass ratio and the lack of explosive plays. He's like, they got two 16-yard runs, and they're barely throwing the ball. Why Why would you not test out throwing the ball more? And the Gophers, I think, had, if you took away the non-military academy schools, so the Army, Navy, Air Force schools, they had the highest run rate of any team in college football last year. Yep. And, uh, you know, they they were good at running the ball, but it was just such a ridiculously conservative way about going about offense. You have a fifth-year starting quarterback. You've got some weapons on the field and a pretty good offensive line. Yep. I'm not going to judge them off of the one. They were just trying to run the ball, keep the clock moving, and get, get out of there. But I want them to unleash Tanner Morgan and these weapons a little more often than they did in previous years since Soraka was last year in 2019. That's my I biggest think, gripe, I guess. I think I know why they didn't, too. And it, it makes sense. That's a game where I put nothing on film. Sure. I put nothing on film. Just run the ball. Here, yep. Here's the thing is. Um, um, Morgan and, and Soraka now being back together is not a new thing. And so ultimately, because uh, um, Soraka was not gone for that long, ultimately a lot of the pieces probably that, that were established in 2019 remain in place here. I'm not going to show you anything. The only game that I might consider a little bit is Colorado. Yeah. But like you should, these first two games... I would prefer to hide to hide my intentions in practice because these first two, two games you should roll. Now we can talk about if they're if these games are actually useful or not because I think that there's a case to, to be made that they're 100 not. Um, but I think the reason why against a team like that that you don't get cute is is if that's committed to film and Big Ten teams can scout that, why give them that advantage? Because yeah, the plays are going to work. That's you know, a fair right? point. Yeah. So Just that's run, my guess. Run them in practice. Uh, yep. All right, let's get to some of the feedback here. This is from Quarantined Aaron on Twitter. You preach mediocrity with the Vikings. Shouldn't the standard, and uh, let's see here, and the Vikings are a top seven regular season team of all time. Well, if you look at the top 10 or 11 regular season teams of all time, all of them have multiple Super Bowl titles. Okay. Uh, he says, so he's saying that mediocrity shouldn't be the standard for the Vikings, yet you enjoy Gophers football never taking a step forward. So I actually responded to this on Twitter last night, and I wanted to bring it to the show here today. Because we do get this when it comes to other teams in town, too, that, well, you, want the, you hold the Vikings to a Super Bowl, so you're hard on the Vikings. Why mm -hmm. don't you hold the Timberwolves to a championship standard? Well, at some point we will. But there are steps. It's not just, you know, go from zero to 60 the reason why we hold the Vikings to a Super Bowl standard is because they've been around for 60-plus years. 
They've it's the only thing that they've never done. It's the best team in NFL history to never win a Super Bowl. They have a 33, 34 year old quarterback in his prime with the third highest cap hit in the NFL. They've got other veterans on the field. They are built to win now, and the only thing they've yet to do is win a Super Bowl. And so, go go get it. If they strip it down and rebuild, then we're going to give them a little bit more leeway. Okay, all right, let's let's go back to. You know, eventually, let's get up to the Super Bowl, you know, measurement here. The Timberwolves, they've advanced in the playoffs once in like 33 years. And so at some point, yes, we'd like to see championships. But let's start with a 50-win season for the first time in 18 years and go from there. And to compare the Vikings to the Gophers, so the Vikings play in the NFL socialist structure where all of the revenue gets distributed across all 32 teams. The Green Bay Packers are doing pretty much just as well financially as the New York Giants. Because the NFL has a very socialist revenue-sharing structure. Every team has the same salary cap situation, whether you're, again, Los Angeles or Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And so, and even even like when it comes to the draft, the the worst teams get a shot at the best players in the draft. It's a very socialist sports structure. College football is wide open. The Gophers reside in a state that ranks 35th in blue-chip high school players available on an annual basis. So they're, they're not sitting in like, Florida, California, Mississippi recruiting ground. So the I think it's fair to say the Vikings should be held to a far higher standard based on their parameters than the Gophers. Not that we can't hold the Gophers to a standard, but to compare the right. two is, is ridiculous. Well, and and let's also just think about the uh, the passion directed towards teams. The Vikings. I mean, this is a Vikings town. There is a passionate, huge fan base. The Gophers have a fan base, but it's not nearly as big. And and the excitement, if you think about if the Gophers and Vikings both get off to good starts, all right, the excitement that surrounds the Vikings' good, good start is is just a buzz, like the town is a buzz. If the Gophers get off to a good start, it's like, oh, w- we'll see. So, like, I, I just take this, too, as as what's the passion of, what's the passion level in this town about teams? Um. We don't have a show called Go for Football Daily. Uh, and that's because, look, it's fun to go. People enjoy it. But the passion, it's not even close. It's not even close. I, I had a guy who was debating me a couple of days ago about the fact that, that this is a Twins town. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is a Vikings town. Like, there is no debate no, there. This is a Vikings town. And so I think it's very fair to hold what I consider to be easily, and this includes hockey too, so the state of hockey, um, easily the most um, popular team in the entire state, the Vikings, right? They get held to a standard that people want to see them win a Super Bowl. Like if the Gophers, what, and, and plus Phil, what's the best case here? The best case for the Gophers, like like off the charts good, would, would be to win the Big Ten West, possibly get by like the Buckeyes in the Big Ten championship game, and then win a Rose Bowl that that's not part of the championship series, probably. Well, like if they were to if they were to get if they were to beat Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game, they'd be in the college football playoff. Almost okay, certainly. But I don't, but I don't think they would beat Ohio State in a. I agree with that. <laughs> but my point, my point being is as far fetched with the luck that the Vikings have had, as far fetched as it might seem to talk about them winning championship, it is plausible. Like it's a conversation. What I just said to you about the Gophers, I can't even imagine happening. Yeah, like the Big Ten West, uh, you could win, but at that point, I'm like, okay, that's a successful season. Yeah, and part of the reason is, let's unpack it here. Okay, Ohio State every year brings in like 15 four-star recruits. Yep. The Gophers, if they can get one or two four-star recruits, it's a it's a great recruiting cycle for them. And and that gap exists in part because of you know, decades of brand building for Ohio State and the fact that Ohio State, Ohio as a state, I believe, is a much more fertile recruiting ground than Minnesota is for football players. There's just, there's, there's, there aren't like checks and balances that even out the playing field in college football like there are in the NFL. You know, it's not, all right, everyone, everyone's going to get the same amount of NIL money and everyone's going to get the same access to the best players. Sure. In the NFL, you pick a player in the draft against their will. And now he plays for you. In college football, it's the opposite. Players choose the schools they want to go to, and then the you know, winning year after year compounds in terms of your ability to 
to get the best players. Crackpot Podcast on Twitter says, what the hell is with Minnesota football coaches just abusing their premier running backs in meaningless games? How many times have we all braced ourselves when Dalvin Cook runs up the middle on first and 10 deep in the third quarter when the Vikings actually have a commanding lead? Actually, I don't think the Vikings have a lot of commanding leads deep in the third quarter. Uh, I, I think you can probably count on one hand how many. <laughs> Doesn't feel like a recent. No, I I think we I think we proved that a few weeks back. Or bashing the hell out of uh, Ibrahim in a game in which the Gophers are literally favored by forty points. Can we get smarter about? I, you know that was yeah. last That's night was. I get that you're trying to get the guy back in in the mix, but I don't know that he needed to touch the ball, what twenty five times or whatever it was in that game last night. Probably mm-hmm. could have uh, probably could have reduced that. those carries. Well, and plus you've got depth. Like you've got guys. So yeah, that I don't disagree there. And and look, I will say this, and I I think Phil that we're on the same page about this one. We both have had and probably will continue to have major problems at times with how Fleck runs a game. There's no question about that. I just want them to not He's fall not into the trap coach. of run, run, run. They have such a ridiculously skewed run pass ratio, and you've got a fifth year quarterback, a, a sixth year quarterback, fifth year starting quarterback in Tanner Morgan. So we'll see. Uh, Charles Raymond via the Scorn Earth app says, if the sports gods were to descend on you and they were to ask you, I hereby decree that I will grant you only one of the following. Mm-hmm. A Viking Super Bowl. Yep. A Timberwolves trip to the conference finals. Oh, he's playing to my heart here. Uh, a wild trip to the Stanley Cup finals. Or twins eliminate Yankees from the playoffs. Whew. What would you choose question. if you could only choose one of those? I love this question. Uh, for me, it's very, very simple. I love hockey. Stanley Cup f- Finals, I've seen two of them in this town. They're fantastic. Uh, the Twins slaying the dragon, as Dave St. Peter talked about a couple years back, would be great, but it's not close. Vikings, Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, I am I serious agree. when I say it was never a joke. Before I die, I want to see that parade. Um, in every other case... I can sort of tell you the reaction. Yeah. The, you know, the Wolves in what, 2004 or so, w- went to the conference finals. It was great fun. The North Stars in the Stanley Cup finals was unbelievable. Twins, I've seen two World Series titles, um, which were great, fantastic. I honestly can tell you, I do not know how long this state, and in particular the metropolitan area, would shut down for if the Vikings won a Lombardi trophy. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, listen, I, I would love to see the Timberwolves get to the conference finals because I'm a huge Timberwolves stan. But I saw that like 18 years ago, so I, ha- I have seen it fairly recently. I don't remember the North Stars' last trip to the Stanley Cup finals, so that would be something new for me, so I'd be interested in that. And I've never seen the Twins beat the Yankees in the playoffs, so that would be I, all of these would be highly appealing. But, sure, yeah, Vikings Super Bowl is definitely next level. Uh, and then Josh J here via the Score North app. So he's following up on our conversation about apartment noise last week, which started with Declan's dog, Vinny, pissing off neighbors by barking. And and you could hear the barking bleeding through the walls. And then I told a story about how, yeah, my roommate and I had some neighbors that lived up above us over in the St. Anthony main area, like, I don't know, 15 years ago. And we could hear them uh, having a good time with each other. Late at night, eater, 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 eater. And so my roommate drew a picture of them. He's a very good artist, and he drew a picture of here's us sleeping. Here's you guys in a very graphic video of or, doing what you're doing, drawing what you're doing, and it makes it hard for us to sleep. And he taped it on their on their door, and then and and they didn't know. Well, I guess they knew because he drew like us below them, so he they knew who taped it on their wall. I guess yeah, good for him. But uh, they stopped for like a month, and then they uh, they got back at it. So Josh J via the Score North app says, I had a similar issue last summer with my upstairs neighbors participating in the bedroom Olympics consistently. The last draw was when it was 2 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday, and I had a meeting at 7 a.m. the next day. The gold medalists were going at it for at least an hour and were letting out war cries for the entire hallway to hear. I rigged up my Bose speaker and stuck it to the ceiling. I queued up. I just had sex by Akon. I pressed play on full volume the moment they finished. Never heard another sound from them until I moved out later in the year. Not all heroes wear capes. (laughs) That is okay. That is awesome. That's the best one I've ever heard. That's next level, man. That's hilarious. That's the best one I've ever heard. 
Oh Josh J, congratulations for standing your ground. All right. Yeah. Not all heroes wear capes. So he probably drew complaints from elsewhere then. Oh, he probably with, yeah. He I'm with sure, the song. Yeah, blasting, playing blasting music. I've had I've had you know, living in apartments or condo complexes before. Sometimes people will have like the bass or the subwoofer turned up oh, too high, it. and that is ridiculous. Or you can hear them watching a movie as if they're in the living room with you. So that's yes, yes. So so here's my question: Are condos as bad? Because like it I depends would, on how they're built. If I'd if be they're... really mad if I bought like if I bought and was stuck like an apartment. Yeah. I guess you know because you're renting and, and a condo would really piss me off. And it, and sometimes you, it's tough to know until you live in it. You oh know, you sure. Can, you can do a tour and you can you can kind of try to feel out. Can you hear as you walk down the hallways? Can you hear people? But that's always the tough gamble about apartment. Sometimes you get what you pay for too. Correct. You know, if it's a little bit more expensive, it might mean a few more bricks, a little bit more sturdiness, a little more concrete between the the units. Okay. You know? But man, there's man. When I was a kid, I remember, and I didn't at the time. I was like, oh, who cares? I'm a kid. So my parents divorced when I was like seven years old, and my dad got an apartment over in Brooklyn Center area, and he lived. It was a three a three story apartment complex, and he lived up on the third floor. So we never had any noise above us. But when I go over there, I was like, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. The first few years, I would go over there, and I on I'd go over there on the weekends, and there'd be college football on on Saturdays or baseball in the summer. And I would love to play like indoor baseball or indoor football. I would just like throw the ball to myself and, oh, yeah. you know, and I would dive around. Oh yeah. That's and right. there was an old couple that lived right beneath my dad and they had gopher season tickets and they would give us, I think just to get out of the apartment on a Saturday, she would like give us tickets to go watch the Jim Wacker gophers get slaughtered by, you know, Ohio she state hated or whatever. You too. That's what that means. Hated yeah. you. And I think her name was Jean, and she definitely is no longer alive because she was probably in her mid-80s. But uh, she used to tap on the – with a broom handle. She would she would oh, tap good. on the, yeah. the I, ceiling for her. And my dad would always be like, Philip, yeah. I, mean, I want you to have fun this. when you're over here, but – yeah." Go you outside gotta, and do it. You got to keep the noise down. Wasn't there like a little grass? Yeah, no, we would or something do that too. for you to go dive on. But I wanted like as the games were on TV, I wanted yeah. to be watching the games and kind of. I hear you, but them. I'm I'm Team Gene here. Yeah, and now that the I'm little... an, an older adult, I am also Team Gene. Poor Gene. That's the one. That's yeah, yeah. Because that would be because like if you were diving and hitting the floor and stuff. That probably shook things oh downstairs. My God. And I would be, I would also, Pictures I, we stuff. had a little basketball hoop set up, like a Nerf, just it wasn't like an actual basketball. But, uh, you know, I would jump up and dunk and then land and stuff. And my dad was always like, Philip, you got you got to stop doing that. Yep. Uh, as an yep. adult, I can that, appreciate it. But Nice work. Nice yeah. work. Poor Jean and her, her <laughs> last years had to listen to you diving around the apartment above. Yep. All right, that's a wrap on this Feedback Friday. Tomorrow we'll hit you guys with an action movie rewind, RoboCop from 1987, one of the most gloriously and underrated gory movies of uh, of that era of action movies. And don't forget, you can check out our daily Vikings conversations on Purple Daily. Click subscribe on the Purple Daily and the Score North YouTube channel so we can spread the word about uh, this community of Minnesota sports fans you guys are helping us build. Mackie and Judd, see you guys.